Welcome to the Preparing for a Virtual Campus and Hybrid Learning Solutions webinar hosted by Comstar Technologies. I'm Dean Perrine, Executive Vice President of JSA, and welcome to the webinar. In this webinar, our expert panelists will detail what heading back to campus will look like for their schools and how to best prepare for a virtual learning environment, including how to prepare for a virtual campus, current trends in remote and hybrid learning solutions, how to conquer remote learning obstacles and keep your class connected, available funding and grants for education technology, and finally, uh, provide an inside look at a live hybrid learning environment. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before we jump in. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box throughout the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many as possible in the allotted time. However, if we don't have time to get to your questions, we invite you to join us on the Comstar Technologies LinkedIn page after the event where we will be happy to address any outstanding questions. We will be posting the link to the post event LinkedIn discussion right in that chat box, so be on the lookout for that. Okay, we've got a lot to talk about and um, only an hour to do so. So let's go ahead and get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our expert speakers and thought leadership, uh, thought leaders for today's virtual roundtable. They are Mr. Joe Andrulis. Joe is the executive vice president at BiAmp. We have Mr. Abdul Chaudhry. Abdul is the director of strategic accounts at BiAmp. We have Mr. Bob White. Bob is the Director of Audiovisual Solutions at Comstar. Mr. Greg Stanley. Greg is the Director of Technology at Collegium Charter School. And finally, Mr. Carl Marks. Carl is the Chief Information Officer at Alvernia University. Gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. You got it, you got it. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Carl and Greg, this is specifically for you. Uh, let's talk about opening plans. I know that's on the, the, uh, the hearts and minds of a lot of people right now. There's obviously a lot of major changes this year. Um, have, have you had to make changes in your typical back to school plans to comply with local regulations? How does the start of the school year differ from years past? Um, has your, cha uh, your approach changed? Carl, this, uh, we'll start with you. I think the, the short answer is absolutely. Uh, the, the biggest problem that or op obstacle that we face is one that has nothing to do with technology. So whether you've been here at the school for one month or 40 years, this is the first time where usually parents of students have the jitters, students have the jitters. This year, students, parents, faculty, staff, it's an unknown for everyone as we bring our students back to campus here starting in August 27th. Um, the second biggest challenge is the physical distancing requirements. So uh, we're contending, the good news is we have a record number of incoming freshmen this year. Uh, the challenge that presents is both a housing challenge and a classroom because we're limiting classroom sizes to accommodate for physical distancing. We've had to come up with making classrooms where classrooms never were or existed before. Now again, the cancellation of the uh, athletics programs in the fall have made a lot of athletic space available that we're converting into classroom space. So that's about a summary of where we're at at Alvernia. Thank you, Carl and Greg. Anything to add here? Yeah, um, just sort of uh, going off of what Carl said. Um, yes, there has been a lot of changes. Um, we are a uh, brick and mortar charter school here located in Exton, Pennsylvania. Uh, we have about uh, 32, 3,300 kids. So uh, we intended uh, throughout the summer to start uh, school back in full swing. Um, and as the regulations changed week by week, our plans changed by week by week. Um, I believe we had since April through last week, we've had about six or seven plans that have changed. Um, you know, sort of like what Carl said, you know, distancing was huge. You know, you take a look at the amount of students we have with our square footage. Um, you take into consideration our staff. Um, you know, PIAA rules with sports keeps changing as well. So we ultimately decided that, you know, going remote was probably our best option. Um, you know, uh, we pushed our week back uh, for the opening. Normally we would start next week, uh, the week of, or the 17th, but we're going to start the 24th. Uh, we looked at a couple of other options. A lot of local schools are starting after Labor Day. 
um, like sort of, you know, in that same realm where technology does play a big part, but the physical distance was just a lot. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm seeing that in my own community as well. But let's have a little bit of fun and get our, our registrants involved in the webinar a little bit with the first poll question. That question is, how are your local schools starting the year? Back to campus as usual, back to campus with many new precautions, a hybrid, some physical, some remote, or 100% remote. I'll give, uh, let's take uh, five or 10 seconds to get those in. I will make my answer, there it is. Excellent. Okay, uh, look at that. That is a little bit of a surprise to me, uh, but um, panelists, um, is there anything? We're looking at 3% back to school as usual, 8% back to campus with many new precautions, 38% hybrid, some physical, some remote, and 51% 100% remote. That's a little bit of a shocker to me. Does that, is that surprising anyone else? I think that matches pretty closely. I have two, two kids in college and that matches pretty closely to what we're seeing. Um, you know, certainly there was a lot of interest in trying to at the very least have some sort of a hybrid where there'd be some amount of on-campus participation. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't improved as quickly as people had hoped. You see people at least providing the option for people to almost do a complete uh, virtual experience. So uh, I do think that there's a uh, the hope that this is like a one term sort of situation and then maybe come the winter term there will at least move back to the hybrid and, and migrate gradually to a back room and classroom um but uh, yeah I, I guess that that's pretty close to what i was expecting i agree with you 100 percent. i think you know in the k-12 realm of things you know we want to get the students back as, as quickly as we can but it's just that fear uh that that um uncertainty if you will where you know we just don't know um Hence the reason why most K-12 districts are opting to do uh, either a hybrid or, or all remote until the end of the first or um, term or first trimester, that is. Yeah. Yeah, and a great segue, you guys, because we want to talk about um, kind of the hybrid learning, um, you know, buying journey. Um, and so we're talking about hybrid. So, Carl, this will be for you. You know, how are you preparing your students to return to campus during the, the new normal? What new protocols um, have you put in place to in, ensure students are safe? What factors led to selecting that hybrid learning solution? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, this is a journey that we've been on since uh, mid-March when we decided to, well, we were forced to leave campus, right? So we've been planning for this. So tons and tons of planning and communication with incoming students through, you know, virtual uh, meetings that we've had with students and parents and training of all the faculty and staff. Uh, our biggest challenges are really the, uh, you know, this new classroom environment that we've talked about, uh, the need to come up with many, many classrooms. And then in addition to that is to, um, to almost turn every classroom into a video conference capable classroom. Uh, Zoom is the platform that, that we use here. Um, you see the, on Bob White's screen on the right hand side, it's a cart with a large TV display. I'll call it Zoom on Wheels. And uh, we're basically putting one of those in almost every classroom that we have. And we hear a lot of people talk about uh, giving students the ability to come in virtually into Zoom sessions. Interestingly enough, one of the challenges that we're also dealing with is faculty members who have, you know, because of, uh, you know, medical conditions, et cetera, are concerned about coming back onto campus. So we have to allow faculty members to, you know, conduct the class remotely, which is presenting a whole nother challenge for us as well. But uh, Comstar has been a great partner with us. Uh, we've collaborated on our solutions and, uh, you know, I think we have a, a good plan in place and we're just keeping our fingers crossed now on product availability because these products literally are flying off the shelves on an hourly basis. Um, very good, thank you, Carl. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that technology, the considerations um, for, you know, the re remote student needs. And Greg, I'm gonna direct this one to you. Are, are, there, are there any aspects of remote learning that have surprised you to this point? 
Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that has surprised me the most is, um, you know, one of the things with our school that we look at is the community and the outreach, um, making sure that there's equity um, within the students' education. Um, so one of the things that has surprised me the most was just, you know, there still are a certain percent, seven to five percent of our students um, that do not have internet capabilities at home. So it's just reaching out and uh, working with the vendors, um, trying to find a solution that will help these students um, learn. Uh, the other thing was we still had staff members that, you know, didn't have reliable internet. Um, so it's another thing that we had to do was kind of reach out to them and, and, and work with vendors. Uh, the other thing that has surprised me, and, and Carl hit the nail on the head, if you will, with the uh, vendor thing. Um, we work with a lot of different vendors and the, the availability of equipment is, is, is very difficult right now. Um, and that's more on the Chromebook side of things. So coming up with plan Bs and plan Cs is very critical uh, in this time of, of, I don't wanna say crisis, but in crisis. For sure, so, um, so what, are, what are some of the, the benefits that you see from, from remote learning? Uh, one of the things that I see is it allows the student to have either asynchronous or synchronous learning opportunities. So if the student uh, learns a little bit better in the afternoon, um, they're able to watch the recordings. Um, Carl mentioned that they use Zoom. Uh, we just went with a LMS platform, School, Schoology. And uh, with Schoology, we have um, a conferencing uh, software that we use with big blue button. And uh, one of the things that it allows us to do is have a synchronous and an asynchronous learning um, library, if you will. So we you know, have the ability to have the students log in at eight o'clock to their regular schedule. And then with the asynchronous learners, uh, it allows them to kind of take it day by day. Um, you know, if they got something going on, they have doctor's appointments. Uh, it it, it kind of gives them the flexibility, if you will. You know, that's fascinating. I, I have three children myself, and they're all a little different. You know, my daughter prefers to, you know, to work between like one o'clock and six o'clock, whereas my, my youngest likes to, likes to do things earlier. So um, I definitely see that as a benefit as well. But what other considerations um, is your school taking to ensure that students are really, really set up to, uh, to make this a success? Yeah, uh, again, um, you know, one of the things that we did was we, we purchased a LMS right away in the spring. Um, so kind of having that platform in place, um, you know, Carl mentioned training, you know, training all of our staff members. We're adding that extra week to give that extra week of training to the staff, um, you know, and, and and making sure that equity is there. Uh, again, working with the vendors, uh, creating that relationship to make sure that all the kids have uh, the ability to get a Chromebook, uh, the ability to have internet, um, and to be able to learn. Very good. Um, let's shift gears just a little bit here. Let's talk a little bit about what, you know, the, those solutions, um, if you will, you know, the difference between an off the, shil uh, off the shelf or store bought solution and a commercial grade solution. And Joe, I, I believe that this is probably best directed to you. Um, there are a lot of out of the box solutions on the market. I was just actually looking at some of those myself um, yeah. and, they, and they, that may be tempting and some of them were, but what makes a commercial grade product kind of stand out right now? Sure. Um, so off the shelf, so there, there's a lot of off the shelf solutions available today, and, and many of them are, are really very, very excellent. Um, and they're very, very excellent for what they were designed to be. Uh, and so what kind of characterizes an office of solution is they're typically designed for a relatively narrow specific use case. Uh, personal uh, systems are uh, probably one of the best examples where you can put something in the, on top of your computer and it's maybe useful at home. And you pretty much know what the limits of the environment are going to be and the demands of that particular use case are going to be, right? It's, it's pretty well constrained. Um, those don't translate as well to uh, spaces, right? And as the space gets larger, you have more and more uncertainties, more and more variabilities in that space type, and the challenges become all that much greater. And so something that is pre-configured and kind of uh, fixed in purpose uh, will tend to start running into its limits a little bit more quickly. Commercial grade systems, in contrast, are designed for precisely those kind of environments where you do have some very, very demanding uh, conditions. Uh, those conditions may vary in time, they may vary space to space. So you might have some rooms that are, maybe there's a lot of glass in them and you get a lot of echoes and reflections and other ones where lots of chairs in there, or, or maybe the furniture is reconfigured relatively frequently, right? So the, 
behavior and the acoustic characteristics of the space are really never quite the same. Uh, you'd be surprised that even spaces, uh, you know, classrooms, how much different they sound when they're full of bodies uh, versus when they're not, uh, when they're empty, right? Bodies absorb sound, for instance, and uh, they tend to mute echoes. But then you have fewer students in there, as we're seeing right now, you're going to have greater echoing. And uh, that may not seem like a big deal in some situations, or you may, you may be able to detect it, but, but you're like, well, okay, fine. It doesn't sound quite as good as it used to, but uh, it's certainly something we can get through a class. Uh, but I think what we really have to be sensitive to in these periods where this isn't just the occasional class going online, people are talking about having these um, remote or hybrid experiences pretty much all day, every day, the audio and the video quality becomes really, really critical. And you could become very, very exhausted quite quickly and people start, will start tending to focus on the, the audio visual experience and not on the learning experience. And that's clearly not where we want students' attentions to be. And so um, commercial grade solutions have a couple of different capabilities baked into them. Number one, they tend to be highly flexible. So they're easily tuned so that they can accommodate the kind of variations that I've just discussed. Uh, they tend to have higher performance in general. People will, uh, commercial grade solutions can invest a little bit more money into premium components, having a little bit more sensitive microphones, uh, put a little more processing power in some of these units so that they can more uh, conduct more signal processing and therefore condition both the audio and the video uh, to deal with some of these uh, perturbations and distortions that might come up. Uh, another thing that's very, very critical, especially as uh, uh, universities and primary uh, grade schools put these in more widely, is how do they, how easy are they to maintain and install on a widespread basis? Commercial or uh, the off the shelf solutions oftentimes are not really expected to work in these large um, communities of, of capabilities. And so maybe they don't have great built-in security functionality or great remote monitoring and remote maintenance uh, uh, capabilities. Commercial grade solutions really have that as one of its foundation expectations. And so they, the good quality commercial grade solutions will all include those kind of capabilities. Um, and they tend to be, like I said, very, very adaptable. Some of them even now adding that adaptability so it's dynamic, uh, which is again, really, really essential. We see classrooms that have been configured to hold 30 students now being reconfigured to hold maybe a dozen, maybe less. These students are moving around in space. Well, can we ensure that the microphone pickups, which might have been statically assigned to pick up particular zones quite evenly, can now dynamically adjust to people who might be moving around that space quite a bit more. Again, good quality commercial grade solutions are gonna have those kind of features and functionalities built in. So what I would argue is that this really is an either or, really, I mean, the, the off-shelf the self solutions are excellent for the use case for which they're hurt, and you can rarely beat them for price and simplicity for when they're in that sweet zone, buy them in those sweet zones. Um, but then probably don't stretch them into the cases where they're not intended because you're probably going to be dissatisfied. You're probably going to find that you're going to buy them and then buy the replacement for them. And uh, in, 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 the, in the interim period, have an experience that really the students are very satisfied with, the educators aren't satisfied with, and don't really produce the outcomes that we're all uh, attempting to go and produce. So uh, that's how I guess I would, I would judge the, the balance between off the shelf and commercial grade. That really does sound like you're, we're, we're talking about, you know, it's, uh, you gotta, you gotta make sure that you're, you're getting the right solution for the right application. <laughs> if, uh, you know, if, if you're in a setting more like what you're discussing and off the shelf solutions simply won't work. Yeah, um, so, um, so that's good. And, and obviously the, the level of customization with the commercial solution. So, um, yeah. okay. Thank you for that, Joe. Um, more fun. Uh, let's go to another polling question. Uh, what is your greatest uh, concern as you prepare for a virtual or for a hybrid or virtual campus? What is your greatest concern as you prepare for a hybrid or virtual campus? Budget, student staff experience, deployment and ongoing support, all of the above. Give you uh, another five or 10 seconds here.
Abdul, any guesses on where, where it's going to be? Oh, here we go. I already got, <laughs> already got the <laughs> answer okay, in so, front of me. Uh, but but yeah, yeah, student staff experience at 46%, all of the above at 44%. Um, any, any, anything stick out to you here, Abdul? Yeah, so I was, I was going with all of the above. <laughs> I think um, each, each one of them are important depending on which perspective you are looking at them from, right? So if I'm, if I'm running IT and AV from school, uh, my prime concern is how can I deploy these effectively? And once they are deployed, how can I manage these effectively, right? So, um, but while uh, I'm faculty or I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking at what's the best possible experience I can give to my students and rest of the teachers. So I think uh, my vote was for all of the above. <laughs> Anybody else care to uh, chime in? I, I would just add, yeah, I, I, I am not surprised it came in in that order, right? All of those are, are really, really good things that I know people are concerned about. But let's face it, at the end of the day, if it doesn't successfully create an uh, education environment that lets us convince ourselves that, you know, that this kind of... Uh, remote framework succeeds, it doesn't matter whether we got a great deal on it or not. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I would defer to the educators here uh, more so than uh, Abdul and myself, but uh, I, I'm not surprised by that rating. How about you, Carl? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think the experience trumps all, right? And uh, it's the type of thing where budget, we know that we're spending a lot of money to make this hybrid environment available to our faculty, staff, and students, but the alternative is devastating financially if we're not able to bring the students back here on mm -hmm. campus. And, uh, you know, so you, you just have to deal with that. And uh, the president doesn't want to hear at all about the difficulty of deployment and uh, support. It's just a given that that will be there. So we'll figure that out. Greg, I see you shaking your head. Anything to add here? I agree 100%. And I kind of view it as it's my job as the director of technology to see why cost is not an issue. Let's, let's find a reason to do it because we're educating kids. And that's why we're all here is to make that happen. Excellent points. Uh, let's continue the fun. How about a verbal case study walkthrough with our friend Abdul? Abdul, do you, um, can you provide an example of a, a school that recently completed their transition to virtual learning? You know, every campus, whether K through 12 or higher education, has their own needs and requirements for the classroom. Why don't you walk us through what an, impl an implementation looks like from start to finish? Sure. So um, I'll, I'll take two minutes to kind of walk you through virtually through two case studies. Um, one of them being K through 12 application. And like everybody here, here mentioned that plans continue to change. But I think uh, the school that I'm talking to, they finally came to a realization that like it or not, they will have a, a time where they will have a, a complete remote sessions. They will have a hybrid scenario. And then eventually they will be moving probably to full time back to school scenario. So. Uh, the requirement for very simple, um, easily deployable, cost-effective budget, and to provide that best possible experience um, to the students in the classroom and remote as well. And uh, the concern was that they were looking for a solution which didn't have a lot of learning curve for, for the teachers to come in and uh, have a large learning curve with regards to deployment. Environment-wise, large number of classrooms, K through 12 environment, and few of the rooms had displays in it and some didn't, and uh, Zoom or Schoology type platforms were selected. So after careful evaluation of solutions, um, they finalized on our Devio product line. And the decision factor was because students will be continuously moving, they will not be sitting in the same place, there will be social distancing, and the conversation needs to, to uh, make it to the laptop and the remote end as well. So the technology itself provides beam tracking microphones that allows for audio pickup from wherever the student is in the room. Um, and from simplicity perspective, it was very simple, as simple as connecting a USB connector into, your, into the uh, teacher's laptop. So, and if the room had a video display, that was part of the solution as well. And if it didn't, it didn't have to be. 
Um, and from perspective of management, I think the, the most attractive part to the decision makers was that they could manage and deploy this solution in 200 plus classrooms using a software tool from their desktop. So the, the SageView software, which is part of an application that uh, Biam provides with all their hardware that's uh, sitting on the network, they were able to deploy it, configure it, manage it remotely. I think and in the budget uh, requirement and their requirements from the uh, uh, user's perspective, I think this was the best possible solution um, they came up with and it was deployed. So that was kind of like a K through 12 environment um, where and then we have another university where the challenge was, they have some very high end large classrooms, which are tiered stadium seating type classrooms. And they will have students coming in um, on social distancing. And even if you're not doing social distancing, we all know students don't like to sit in one line in the front row. They, you will, you, they will be all over the place, right? So. The challenge is that they wanted to create a contactless classroom, uh, which was a video enabled, video conferencing enabled classroom. Um, and one of the, the things that they did was in designing that solution is they were able to use um, a buy in platform. And one of the decision criteria was they had a great previous experience with the buy in platform. And top of their list was based on the amount of support staff they had the uptime and reliability of the solution they put in place was prime importance in, in it, besides user friendly and everything else. And secondly, they didn't, um, some of the faculty was teaching for the first time with students on the remote end. So they didn't want teachers to coming in and trying to change camera presets or, okay, now you look at the student is talking, now you gotta look at me, I'm talking, and it's a large classroom environment. So in that scenario, Basically, what um, quickly not going into ones and zeros of a solution, but they were able to to get um, our beam tracking microphone information from our DSP solution, and basically use that information to recall presets on the camera. So if the students were tag talking and that particular quadrant um, was active from audio perspective, they were able to get that information back into a control system. They were actually using a dedicated PC for that, but. The idea is they were able to bring it into a control system and send um, logic commands to their camera that, okay, now you need to be focused on that preset in this particular quadrant. And then when, the, when it came back to, to, the, to the professor, that same information based on the beam tracking of the microphone was done. And based on this scenario at a dedicated PC in the room, only thing the professor had to do was start his room session and um, everything is, is, is scheduled pre-booked. I come into the classroom, I start my session and everything else is automatic after that. So this was, this was a, a high-end solution that was put together using BIAMP, DSP and our beam tracking technology um, and a custom solution for it. So um, without going into too much ones and zeros and design details, um, this is uh, the two virtual case studies I wanted to walk everybody through. Feel, feel free to ask questions. Uh, if you have, we have, I think we have a session later on and um, Comstar has uh, people available who can provide details and information how to put such systems together. Absolutely, Abdul, thank you very much. And it's, it's very insightful. And you, met, you mentioned, you know, uh, getting into the classroom and that's exactly what we're about to do. Uh, Bob, uh, we see you over there in the, uh, in the classroom, hi. Um, so, Bob, you know, one of the most common questions that, that we've heard is, what does a hybrid learning environment actually look like? You know, what should folks ex expect? So, why don't you walk our, our viewers through um, what that hybrid learning environment looks like? <clears throat> sure. Thanks, Dean. So, one thing I want to touch upon that I think that we've kind of talked around, everybody's talked so far, is the idea of remote learning and how it has to be for the students, right? So my oldest daughter, she's in kindergarten. I painfully watched her work through April, May, June, trying to be taught remotely. And I got it that nobody was prepared. No teacher was prepared. The students were prepared. You know, it kind of, it kind of fell flat. So in my mind, when I came back to these setups, um, and as Comstar, we like to be thought of as, as trusted advisors, we needed something that was immersive. And that's, that's the phrase that I keep coming back to. 
uh, it needs to be an immersive experience. Uh, the teacher needs to have a simple, simple experience and it needs to be immersive. If your audio is not good, your students aren't going to be engaged. If your video is not good, your students aren't going to be engaged. So um, we went with a VIAMP solution for the base of our, our hybrid learning solution and a PTZ camera from, from a company called Marshall. And part of the reason we did that is because they are both trusted partners of ours that make products that we can stand behind. So currently, uh, Dean and everyone else on the call, you're hearing me on a, a, a BIAMP beamforming tracking microphone. Um, it's installed in the ceiling. It's aesthetically pleasing. It has pickup throughout the entire space. It is designed to eliminate any outside noise in the space. So if there's a student shuffling their papers, it'll follow the teacher throughout the space and eliminate that noise. Sorry, guys. I think I went out of frame. <laughs> but hopefully you can get the audio experience I was referring to. So for us, it's, it's easy use, right? So all this equipment that you're seeing in here, for a teacher, it's a single connection at, let's say, a podium at, at a desk in the front of the space. You're going to get a single USB connection. And from that, you can plug it into your laptop or a dedicated room PC, and the devices are agnostic. So if it's Zoom, if it's Blackboard, if it's Google Classroom, if it's Teams, the peripherals don't, don't care what you plug it into. So you can get professional grade microphones, professional grade cameras, and your experience at home can be exactly the same as the experience in the classroom, because that's the key for us, I think. As a, as a technology, uh, former field engineer, now design engineer, and, and you know, director of AV, and also as a parent, I know what, what these solutions need to be. And immersive is what we came back to, which is why we designed the solution you, you uh, see today installed. Two solutions. So right now I'm talking to you on, on a BIAMP solution. Uh, this would be permanently installed. And, and a Marshall camera. The camera would be installed in the back of the classroom, get the front of the room. Your audio will be covered throughout the entire space. We also have done a, a modular solution, so a cart, uh, Mark, that Carl alluded to earlier, but I'm actually going to switch the audio and video over to now and give everyone kind of a sense of how that sounds and how that looks. <laughs> All right. So this is your modular cart, right? <clears throat> so the idea here is that you, know, you take this, this cart, you kind of would put it in the middle of the classroom, you still have your students socially distanced across from each other, and then the teacher would actually be talking to, to the far end of the call or you know, the students at home, and they would have the same experience of everybody in the classroom, getting the same audio, getting the same pre presentations short, shared through whatever platform you decide to use, and you could actually take this cart and you could put it in a common space that might be able to facilitate more people, not let lock people down to a classroom. So uh, fully modular, again, a good solution if you want to be able to move things around. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I want to get this to my, uh, my, my kids' school district right away, to be honest with you. We appreciate that. Um, no worries. You got it. You got it. Um, okay, let's go ahead and jump into our next poll question. All right. How is your school or business supporting students and employee needs while remote? Student, family provide internet, hardware, support all the way. School provide hardware. School provide hardware and tech support provided. School provided internet connectivity, hardware, and tech support. Give you a 10 minutes here. Any predictions from the panelists? That there's a lot of people on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm one of those people. <laughs> just, just, just hardware and tech support. Yeah. That's what happened to my kids. <laughs> I think, I think with the lower grades, they may have a little bit more support, but I think uh, the universities might advise on things, but they probably depend on the students to uh, do a little more acquisition. Yeah. The high schoolers got their laptops. Uh, from school and uh, they had laptops previously from school anyways, they just got tech support. Um, and the one university, um, she just gets support, that's it. <laughs> Greg and Carl don't need to guess, right? I mean, you could just give us the answer, Greg and Carl, you, you, you're, you're defining those policies. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you at the K-12 level, uh, we are providing hardware and tech support. Um, and for families that need it, we do have units available um, for Wi-Fi hotspots. You know, I mean, we uh, handed out probably, as students and faculty staff left campus, about 125 laptops that we, you know, borrowed from laboratories or 
PC carts, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, all the support for that, as well as then, as Greg said, it was an exception basis, but I can think of at least about a dozen or so uh, students that we did actually provide, uh, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots as the Starbucks and other locations that they could go to for Wi-Fi access started closing down. How about the, the, uh, the future? What do you, I mean, I'm going off script just a little bit here, gang, but, you know, um, we, that, that's kind of where we are today. Um, I think, you know, just based on my own experience, I think that there's probably going to end up being some carryover, even kind of post-COVID, post all of us worrying about this, the existing environment that we're living in. There's going to be some, some carryover, um, and this, kind, this question kind of gets to some of that. I mean, do you, do you think that we will be going well, that, that school districts will be more um, more capable, number one, and more willing to do a more hybrid environment based on the needs of their of their students. This is open, so feel free to jump in. I can jump in first. I mean, the one um, I've only been at Alvernia for about a year and a half, and I've spent my entire career in business. So this is my first step into higher education, and it was amazing to me how resistant especially faculty were to change. And uh, they thought Zoom was, you know, something that one or 2% of the world used. Well, I can tell you that this last five months was the greatest training exercise uh, that we've ever had, right? And uh, necessity is the mother of invention, they say sometimes, but uh, it's amazing now how all of these faculty members are now seeing this capability, this collaborative capability, say, well, can we do this? Can't we do that? Can't we build on this? And I'm saying, slow down a bit, because first we just have to get everybody back to class and, you know, create a normal environment. And then we can start leveraging it. But I think, as you said, Dean, the opportunity to leverage this uh, technology evolution that we've gone through is going to be significant. Um, I think the, the content for remote education uh, will, will, will change a lot, in my opinion, whether we like it or not. Um, we, we can do remote education, we can put classrooms together for video and everything else, but content will need to change a little bit. I think that's what the future will bring, a, a, a content that will be also hybrid, which will be applicable to students in the room and also applicable to students that are sitting remote. So that's how I look at it. I think this is actually not just the ability to do remote learning is being tested and, and we're learning a lot about its limits and its capabilities. Um, but I think, you know, you're also dealing with a generation who has time shifted their video watching since they grew up, right? This whole thing of going to someplace at a particular point in time and that was your only opportunity is the way we did it back in the days when you watch series when they came out at seven o'clock on, on a Wednesday. They expect to be able to go and just do it on demand and to work with uh, their peers and other people kind of interactively. So I don't think that this will, will displace in-classroom learning, but I think we will get much, much better at hybrids uh, solutions that mix the in-classroom experience, time-shifted experience, and simultaneous blended learning experiences with remote participants, all as part of portfolio of learning opportunities. And th that gets me really excited. I really just think we're at the doorstep of what's possible. And, and certainly at Biamp, we're thinking about that all the time, about what, what, what tools we might be able to give educators next. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with everyone on the panel. Um, I think blended learning is here to stay, and I think we need to embrace it. Um, I definitely think that, you know, what Abdul was saying with the content, I think the content needs to, you know, we will grow and, and you know, buying learning management systems, you know, is only going to enhance that environment. I love it. Um, Bob, since you gave such a great, uh, you know, kind of demonstration, your, your thoughts on, on this? I mean, is this, is this kind of thing here to stay? Yeah, I think in the right Im implementation, Dean, and as I was kind of saying, it really does go back to me is that immersive factor. If, if students can figure out how to learn and it's, and it's successful remotely, you know, I think it opens up a, a Pandora's box of, of opportunities for, for schools like Alberni and Collegium. You no longer have to you never, no longer have to live within 50 miles of Alvernia to go to college there. If that's a college you really want to go to, or let's say it's your, your parents' alma mater and you want to go to Alvernia, but you live in the Midwest, 
you now are capably from you know, remotely in the Midwest attend classes just the same as somebody, as somebody would who's within 50 miles of the school, let's say. So I think it depends on how much time and effort is put into the rollout and you know, how, how dedicated you are to that solution as a higher education or K through 12. Awesome, thanks, Bob. And uh, gentlemen, great news. <clears throat> we actually did this uh, in the right amount of time to take some Q&A and there are some that, that have come through. So um, I am going to jump right into some of the, uh, the Q&A that came through while we were talking. Um, okay, question number one, what challenges has COVID presented? We knew we were gonna get a COVID question at some point, right? Uh, what challenges has COVID presented to designing effective learning systems and what are you doing to meet those challenges? Joe, I think this is probably one for you. Sure, I'll, I'll give a swing at that because uh, we see that all the time. And uh, you know what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, the, our, our partners are able to go and and overcome these challenges for uh, the educational institutions. But some of the things that COVID is really presenting is, um, number one, the distance learning is an obvious effect. And we've, I think we've talked about that one quite extensively. And, and uh, we've, we've demonstrated a lot of really, really neat tools that are becoming available for that. Uh, I, I, I think in particular, one of the things I want to point out as a challenge here is that even if a lot of people are going full remote now, there will eventually be this migration back to a hybrid learning experience. And um, even when a hybrid learning experience due to social distancing requirements, you're often seeing classrooms broken into multiple physical spaces, right? So there might be people all on campus, but they may not, not literally be in the same room anymore because a large lecture hall may not be practical. So the, um, the challenge there that you see is how do you make sure that everybody has essentially the same experience, right? So that you're not giving that the instructor isn't preferentially teaching to the students sitting right in front of them. And it's real so easy to forget the people on the far end. Uh, the other thing that's easy about the far end experience is if, if, it's, if you deliver a poor audio or video experience and they know that there's nobody there watching, it's very easy for those folks to swivel in their chair and start working on something else and, and effectively detach from the experience. And through no fault of them, they will get a little bit of a substandard um, education opportunity relative to the peers who might be in the class. So really investing in the technologies so that you really do give a great distance experience. You know, I was very impressed by, I hope everybody was too, by, by Bob's uh, demonstration. He saw as he moved around that relatively large space, there's only that one tiny little pendant microphone in there. And yet there was a, the, the audio that we were getting, even as he moved about, was quite even and consistent. That's really, really important, right? If it fades when he turns away, or when he moves away, every one of those is an opportunity for the participants to kind of detach from the experience. And so keeping them engaged is a big challenge. Another challenge is for the instructor themselves. When they come in, as, as Bob was indicating, making sure that it's really easy for them to get up and running quickly is essential. And so the technology has to be easier than ever, more natural than ever, and really not require that they interact with it too much. So again, a microphone that you don't have to literally put on your ear and you can just literally walk in and it's there and yet you don't have to worry about where you stand because it will worry about that for you. It's a real sort of unspoken and invisible convenience for the educator that's really going to make sure that that uh, education experience is as good as it can be. And then one, uh, one other thing that, that people will look for is a preference for using their own devices. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, a preference for their own devices, it's more familiar. So a BYOD experience for either controlling the space or to be able to participate in the space will make it more familiar. And the other big thing is nobody wants to touch anything anymore. So if they go into a classroom, they don't want to touch a control keypad or something that everybody else has been touching and it's sitting in there. And you know, it's just, that's what we're all being encouraged to do, avoid, avoid those things. And so using your own device or better yet, one that you don't need a device at all, the space is able to go and operate nearly autonomously are some really, really great convenience factors. And so those I think are some of the things we're seeing are, uh, oh, and, and of course, part of that too is then the wireless capability so that people can share content, not by having to plug in devices or other things, but do it all wirelessly as you might do, can uh, interact with UC or wireless presentation systems is another really important trend that we're seeing. Um, so that's from a manufacturer, some of the things that we're seeing on, Bob, I don't know, you, you uh, design a lot of these systems and you're in a lot of these classrooms. Maybe you've got some other thoughts. 
So, uh, Dean, usually when people come to us to talk, talk AV, they're, they're looking for a little guidance from the industry. And, and we were, I wouldn't say lucky because it's an unfortunate situation, you know, obviously everything going on in the world, but we've been having these conversations since mid-March, just like everyone else, and, and morphing since, since mid-March. So we've been kind of working our way through this, you know, when they come to us as, you know, a trusted advisor for, for these, these customers and these clients, we are able to say to them, hey, here's, here's what works and here's what doesn't. And we can be, we can be blunt and honest with them. And again, I'll, I'll have an honest conversation with anybody. If they say they're going to get consumer product and think they're going to sit it in a 30 by 30 classroom and it's going to be a good immersive experience for their students uh, there and at home, uh, I'll just flat out tell them that that's not something you can stand behind. And, you know, the, the experience you're having right now is something that we've tested and tested time and time again and implemented. And we know that this, what we have set up here works. It works and it's reliable and it's simple. For the teacher which is very key for us you know we support everything we install but we know that we're behind the first people in line which is usually one one it person and maybe a help desk person they're not a huge staff on site so the the ease of use and the reliability are, are huge and key yep so um here, here's what my two cents are so we i've been in the av for the last 20 25 years and technology and av especially av technology is usually the last thing that comes in. You know, in the, if you're doing an AV project, everything is delayed till the AV goes in and the building is going to open tomorrow. You like it or not, it's going to happen. I'm just thinking that what COVID brought to us, uh, sadly, is that technology will get a little bit more consideration ahead of time as buildings are designed, as schools are designed, as budgets are put together people will pay more attention to technology because now it's business critical, uh, where in certain locations it might not have been uh, in the past. So um, th I think that's something which is very important and comes to my mind. So I just want to add to that, because I, I can tell you just some integrations we've done in the past 18 months for uh, clients where they decided that audio only was what they were going to do in their boardrooms and their large conference rooms. They don't have a need for video. And how many people now we've got systematically gone back and, and had a layer of video onto to, to give you that full experience. And that's how much things have changed where you, you're, you're finally getting these, I don't want to call them older school type, type people, but you know, the way business operates nowadays has changed as well as, as classrooms, obviously. So it seems to be fully being embraced. Yep. Very good. Anything else on the, uh, on the, on the COVID tip right now? Um, Cause we did, we've got a couple of the questions. I'm going to jump right into those uh, if, we're, if we're good. Uh, here's a question that I actually had um, earlier, but as far as, um, because this, this kind of stuff excites me as a, as a father and I'm trying to manage, uh, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a kid who's in college, a sophomore in college. I've got a junior in high school and I've got a fifth grader. They all have different needs. Um, and they all have different, um, 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 ultimately, they all have different wants too. And some want to go back to school, others don't. Um, but, you know, as far as getting something like this implemented um, quickly, um, as, as it's all on everyone's mind, and it is there, are, there, are there lead times here? Are there delays from a kind of procurement and implementation standpoint? Um, what, what is the, the, you know, talk to us a little bit about timing from, from yes, I want this to implementation. Yes, yeah, so Dean, I'll, I'll handle that on our end just from, from dealing with that a, a good bit recently. The, the lead times vary. Um, I get updated emails from, from our vendors. You know, I'll, I'll reach out on almost a daily basis if, if I'm having a discussion with the school. Hey, this is the product we have in place here. This is what we want to layer it on with for video and audio. You know, what's your current lead time? We're, we're looking at that partnership with, with Buy-In to where they, they, they have a lot of stock um, and, it's, and it's stateside. So we know that if we, if we implement with them, that, that our lead time is, is not that great. But then you know, there's some other products that, that take a little bit longer. So we, we strategically take that into consideration now when, when we work on these, these things with schools. And hey, you say you need 30 classrooms turned up. We're going to go out ahead of time and see what that lead time is on, on those 30 classrooms and the equipment associated with them. So uh, Excellent. Any other thoughts on that one? Okay. I think some, uh, some of the solutions that kind of be looked at is from the efficiency and ease of installation perspective, right? So if, if, if I get 30 classrooms to turn around, I think I would be looking at what solution helped me provide uh, an end-to-end -end Cat5 in solution where I don't have to have custom cables or, 
or custom connections and crimping and, and to, things to do on site where I can have my speakers, my microphone, my DSP, my amplifier, the whole chain on a, on a Cat5 cable. I think that comes into play from lead times with regards to installation and support perspective, right? I, I might be able to get hardware, but if it's gonna take me a long time in each class, the lead times work accordingly. So I think some of those things play a role as well. A great point. And you mentioned support, and that's our next question. A uh, question from one of the registrants is, what kind of ongoing support is available? I don't care who addresses it. Who, who feels good? What kind of ongoing support is available? Yeah, I'll grab that, Comstar. So, yeah, so a part of, of who we are, as I said, part, we want to be a partner, a, a trusted advisor. Ongoing or support, our white glove support is one of the keys to everything we've done since the inception of this company. So, Everything we install, we stand behind. Part of the reason why we use the gear that we do and why everything we ever install is commercial grade. Uh, we need to be able to stand behind a product and you know, we need to serve, be able to service that product for you. So uh, we have on-site support. We have a, a support email address. You know, we, have, we have a full team on staff to, to support the, the, and implement the, system, or the implemented systems that we have in place. Certainly the vendors, we, you know, we don't provide direct end user support. The integrators are best <clears throat> and develop or handle that, but we stand behind them, right? So that if Bob's team ever runs into a challenge with a BIAMP product or, or a, just a system in which BIAMP is a participant, uh, they know that they can call us and that we'll be right on it and make sure that, uh, that they succeed. Yeah, Dean, I can take a crack, I'll swing at that as well because I saw another question that came in was, you know, to Greg and I as to, you know, have you worked with a telecom provider in the past to audit telecom spend, et cetera. And, you know, fortunately for us, uh, about shortly after I joined 18 months ago, made the decision to uh, work with Comstar as a trusted advisor on all network related things. So total redesign of our uh, physical and virtual networks on campus uh, we have a voice over IP phone system that we implemented. So, I mean, it is all about the networks. I mean, look at me, my age, there was always that old line is the, you know, is the PC going to win over the mainframe computer? And, you know, at the end of the day, the network won, right? So it's all about the network now. And uh, so far, it's been won back to Pat with Comstar. But I know that if I need a throat to choke, they will be there for me as well. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's very good insights. I appreciate that. Um, one of the questions that came in probably early, um, are these solutions teacher and user friendly? I think that, um, I think Bob kind of demonstrated some of that, but um, is there any other kind of additional customization? Is there anything that, uh, you know, any intuitiveness that you guys want to kind of talk a little bit more about? Yes. Yeah, so so the, the, re team, the reason we, we pick the solutions and most solutions we install nowadays. So if you came to me and asked for, the, let's say, an older school room appliance, let's say a, like a Polycom or a Cisco or something along those lines, um, I, I would really ask you nowadays, I would come back to you and say, why would, why would you want to install something like that? We, we want to make things simple. We want to make them agnostic. I'm sure many people on this call right now have had experiences with, with using video conferencing 10 years ago for anything or five years ago for that matter and how just painstaking it was. So, you know, when we sought out a solution, we get it, you know, I, I've been there, I, I've been the solutions engineer, I've done the end user training. And even that that's more than one or two steps, you're, you're gonna use, use your losers, use your losers, <laughs> use, lose your users, my apologies. So uh, <laughs> really a, a lot of this technology has has built in AI, you know, the microphones, uh, the, the, the microphone arrays, the cameras, things along those lines where, you know, the, the microphone I'm talking into right now, this is a one, one button setup at the, the initial initial go. It, it looks at the, it uses AI to look at the size of the room and kind of do some audio testing and that's it. It's set it and forget it. And then from there, the, the, the teacher gets a, a single USB handoff for, for their connection for everything. One of the other things to uh, add to that is we had talked previously about the distinctions between off the shelf and the, the commercial grade equipment and Bob described some of the differences and. Um, one of the other characteristics about them is they tend to be open and adaptable. And so if an if a education institution has a particular workflow that they want to go and train everybody on, the integrator is usually able to get the 
the uh, commercial equipment to go and ad adapt to it versus having to everybody else adapt to the equipment. Uh, and that's an important distinction, right? I mean, equipment that learns people and not the other way around. Um, so uh, that, that I think contributes to usability. Very good. Um, gentlemen, we did it. We did it in an hour or two. So I feel like, I feel like we could have spent an entire after, uh, afternoon um, here, but uh, we, we, we got it done. But um, if you do have additional questions, and um, I think my team, Amy, you're going to put the, uh, the, the LinkedIn link into the chat box. But if you do have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to move over to the, the, uh, the Comstar LinkedIn page and we'll be happy to get to some additional questions there. Um, we should do this again, probably <laughs> end of the year, uh, first of, uh, of next year, uh, gentlemen. But thank you very much for, for, being, uh, for being with us and discussing this very uh, critical topic right now. Um, uh, th so thank you all. Uh, thank you for our registrants and attendees and specifically to Comstar Technologies for hosting such a timely and insightful discussion. We appreciate it very much. So uh, thank you all and, uh, and be well.